You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating all things Jewish. Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and every now and then, lucky, lucky me, I get a chance to sit with one of my heroes and an individual who has done extraordinary things on the American scene and who has a contact with the Jewish world, the Jewish community, and Jewish history, especially in this country. And I get to talk to him not only about himself and his own work, but his insight into Jewish life, the state of Israel, and other concerns that are always on the minds of American Jews. And so today, it is a great honor for me to recognize and to welcome to Shalom TV, Clarence Jones. First of all, thank, thank you, you so you much. It is wonderful thank having you. you. you Let so me much. tell the audience a little bit about you. Uh, Clarence right now is a scholar in residence at the Martha Luther King Jr. Research and Education Center at Stanford University. Stanford is, of course, in California and is one of the preeminent institutions on the American scene today. And uh, Clarence is also the author of a book that just came out in paperback. It's been out for about a year in hardcover. And it may be one of the most important statements about what's going on in the sweep of American history in the last 50 years. The book is called Behind the Dream, The Making of the Speech that Transformed a Nation, published by Macmillan. And it is Clarence Jones' description of how you know, the speech that has in some way inspired all of us, especially my generation, but younger people as well, the speech by Martin Luther King on August 28th, 1963 at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, the I Have a Dream speech. And it's a speech that we use in my own congregation every Yom Kippur. We read that speech as a sort of a statement. And Clarence, this would be interesting to you. We read this speech in, in a Jewish congregation on the holidays on Yom Kippur during what's called the martyrology, when we mm -hmm. really sort of remember all those who have died in service to humanity. Mm -hmm. For the Jews, there are Jews who have died. Al Kiddush Hashem, we say in Hebrew, mm -hmm. sanctifying God's name. Right. And we remember not only those who died mm -hmm. in Roman persecution times, which is when the original martyrology was written, right. but throughout the sweep of Jewish history down to the present day. And in our congregation, we also recall those who have died as part of humanity's fallen, who have made a contribution. Beautiful. And the speech that you write about in this extraordinary book, Behind the Dream, is one I am privileged to have someone from our congregation read every Yom Kippur. And it is, you have made an extraordinary contribution in many ways, Clarence, but this book is a, a classic, and I'm hoping that everybody who now hears about it will go out and get it. And so first, I thank you for joining me again. Well, thank you so much for having me. Let me, while we're just talking about the, um, I say to whoever I have an opportunity, whether it's an African-American audience, whether it's a university audience, whether as when I was recently in Israel, um, you know, part of his brilliance was that Dr. King recognized that no matter how compelling and no matter how persuasive and just on the merits the case for ending racism and racial segregation was that that the we as we could not that is we the African American community that we could not achieve that by simply uh, preaching about it, articulating mm -hmm. it, or mm -hmm. in the or in the most political sense, trying to impose that point of view on the majority population, just was not going to happen. The way it would happen in America is when 88% of the population, white population, came to understand that what we were seeking to do was in its self-interest. Interesting. Okay. He understood that what, when white people came to understand that it was in their self-interest that racial segregation and, as they say, to be free. Now, it's important 
because sometimes in the history of that period, some important facts are obscured and it's very relevant to your audience. Please. Okay. The most important, reliable, decisive component of what we call the, ge the generic white majority population yes. was the American Jewish community. Okay? Say that S again. The <laughs> most decisive, reliable component of our struggle for success was the American Jewish community, or stated another way. The success, our success, in the Civil Rights Movement, our success in raising the consciousness of America to understand it, it should live out uh, uh, in accordance with its precepts and, and uh, principles and shine the Declaration of Independence, our ability to, to politically do that was made possible because of the working coalition and political alliance we had with the American Jewish community. Now, that's some an people, amazing statement, Clarence. It's amazing. You know what I, you know, let me, let me just say, I, I, I like uh, quoting what Daniel Patrick Moynihan is, uh, is reputed to have said, and that is, um, uh, um, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not much your own set of facts. Okay. <laughs> this is not a, this is not an opinion. You know, this is, this is, this is a matter of historical fact, all right? And so that your audience, Jewish audience and non-Jewish audience, That's I right. say this, yeah. understand, I'm just not talking about the classic, well, you know, they gave a donation, no, 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 no. Yes, financial support, but I'm talking about, I'm talking about uh, people who gave their lives. I'm talking about very personal to me because one of my beloved closest friends in working with Martin King was a fellow by the name of Stanley David Levison. Stanley David Levison. Stan Stanley David Levison, very active in the uh, American Jewish Congress. This man devoted his life 24-7 to working with Martin Luther King Jr. That's on an individual case, but let me just give you, I want to tell you two stories. Okay. Two anecdotal events which I think will set the framework for this. Um, Martin Luther, King, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was uh, assassinated on April 4th, 1968. Just to, in January of 1968, his um, closest working colleague in the Jewish community was Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Yes. And uh, I don't know what particular day it was in January, but, that, but there was an occasion where Rabbi Heschel's birthday was being celebrated. I don't know whether it was 65th birthday, 70th birthday, what day it was. But it was an important birthday. And there was a rabbinical assembly that, had, uh, uh, c that was taking place in the Catskills, New York. And, uh, and this rabbinical assembly had invited Rabbi Heschel up to their weekend congregation. And he had told them, they, they knew of his close working relationship with Martin King. So, uh, the two of them go up to the Catskills because they want to honor Rabbi Heschel on his birthday and they know that Dr. King is going to be with them. So Ra Dr. King tells me the story. They walk into this ballroom, this rabbinical assembly, and there are 1,000 rabbis in this huge banquet hall and they're standing with arms locked in a circle around the wall and they are singing in Hebrew, we shall overcome. Oh my God, Clarence, is that amazing? They two of them stand in the middle of the room, I am told, and tears start coming down their cheeks. Now Martin King, when he told me that story, he, let me tell you why he told me that story. We're talking about anti-Semitism, we're talking about a lot of things. And in the context of what we were talking about, he said to me, he says, Clarence Jones, he says, if you're ever in a circumstance, you're ever in an instance where you hear, actually he said, when you hear some of our brothers or sisters um, saying anti-Semitic things, I want you to tell them that story. 
and I don't want you to sit quietly. He says, I know you wouldn't sit quietly anyway, but I want you to particularly tell them that story when you're in the presence of any African-American who says any anti-Semitic statement about our Jewish brothers and sisters. I never will forget that. Very, that's a lovely uh, story, yes. Clarence. That's a lovely story. Beautiful story. All right, there's a million things. Every, every time you speak, I, want to st I don't want to interrupt you, but right, right. questions come to my mind. Let's take them one at a time. Sure. One of the things that you will hear Jews say right. is that they feel hurt, that the contribution Jews feel they made to the mm -hmm. civil rights movement mm -hmm. and the absolute oneness Jews felt with the black struggle. Right. And I, I will tell you my own personal story in a it's moment. Right, no. But the, the way in which the Jews experienced from behind their eyes their involvement, how many rabbis went down and marched at Selma and, and Montgomery Absolutely. and were there, yeah. and the famous picture of Martin Luther King and Abraham Joshua Pastor actually Hesel walking not, side by side. Picture? Oh, right. it's one of the all-time great right. pictures of American history. Right. Then there seemed to be a backlash in the black community. The African Americans seemed to turn against the Jew as if it was somehow the Jew's fault. We didn't even know for what. But it was as if all of the involvement, which you have not articulated in one of the most beautiful statements I've ever heard, it was as if it never happened. And there seemed to be, for a period of time, serious anti-Semitism in the African-American community. And it's easy to cite a, a Farrakhan, but it's not, Farrakhan's not on the extreme. No, really. I'm talking about within mainstream African-American culture in this country, there seemed to have been the development of anti-Semitism. I want you to speak to that. I want to and speak do you understand why it hurt oh, I can certainly the Jewish under, people? I can understand why it would hurt the Jewish people, especially on the basis of what I said earlier. Yes. Okay. And I want to say that um, their sense of being hurt is not solely subjective without any objective facts. There's truth to it. Okay. There is some truth to okay. it. Okay. Let's take two important events that, that uh, I'm, I'm sure um, may have had a lasting negative effect on the Jewish community. One is that there was a whole rise, even during the civil rights movement after 1966, 67, of the, of the black power movement. Okay. And this was an in, 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 in instance with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee which had been a, um, an interracial organization having lots of uh, a, 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 a young white and black people in its leadership. And many Jews. And, and in, many Jews. In leadership positions. Several Jews. They, in effect, were asked to leave. They, in effect, were denigrated. They, in effect, during that period, by the crazy people who were heading the Black Tower wing of that organization. But having said that, in direct response to your question, is that, yes, why shouldn't the Jewish community feel angered and betrayed? They had, there was an objective basis for it. And then there was this unfortunate incident in Crown Heights in New York occurring under an African-American mayor and an African-American police commissioner. We're talking about a black child. A black child was yes. hit by a car. Hit by a car. Well, thank you. Thank and you for giving me the facts. Yes. Right, right. And, and, and it was in the, earth, in the Hasidic Hasid. community right. of Brooklyn. Right. And there was some real anger. Anger, right. right. Okay. And, and this event, this event uh, 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 fired and turned out to um, inspire uh, uh, an angry retaliatory action. Correct. On the part of the uh, African-American community. And the, t and the retaliatory action, you can't tell it any way than like it was and like it is. It was anti-Semitic based. It was, it was uh, using all of the negative statements coming out of the mouths of African Americans in that community. And you know, leadership consists of two major components among other things. There's active and passive, you know. Sometimes 
for you to know that I'm with you. Sometimes there are instances where in the past I may have been active and spoken, but there may be sometimes when you say, Clarence, you're my friend. And I think I know how you feel, but why are you keeping quiet on this time? Why are you passive? Okay. Afri the African-American leadership at that time did not come out and did not aggressively call uh, that situation what it was. It was pure, unadulterated, anti-Semitic anger. And there was no one to speak at that moment. Those African-American leaders who had the stature, for one reason or another, they either equivocated or they silently stood by and said nothing. So how is the, how is the Jewish community going to interpret that? Mm -hmm. okay. So the real question that we must ask ourselves, my brother, is how do we, and we know, by the way, let's not, let's not, uh, uh, I mean, there are uh, American Jews, while they have their own history and their own community, they're a part of the larger community. And they, and, 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 we, and, and, and we know that just as there were American Jews who gave their lives and put their lives on the line mm -hmm. supporting the civil rights movement, American Jews are no different than any other, except for culturally. They're subject to racism. You're absolutely no, right. No, You're no American, absolutely right. No American Jew I've known who's complained about black Semitism has ever said to me, has never said to me, well, I'm not, <laughs> our, our community is not subject to racism. That's not the issue. We uh, know that's, that's a reality. Correct. That's okay? correct. But it gets back to the, you're saying something in response to what I said earlier. Mm -hmm. What you're saying, you're saying in a different way. If Clarence Jones, who was Dr. King's personal lawyer, political advisor, and I come in and I say to you, and I repeat, that the success of the civil rights movement under his leadership would not have been politically possible without the 24-7 support of the American Jewish community, then you say, I think that's probably right, Mr. Jones. I'm glad to hear you say it. But what really must some of your listeners must say, if, Clarence, if what Clarence Jones says is, is, is a fact, and he insists that it is a historical fact, then how does he explain how that part of the coalition that was so essential was so badly treated. Exactly right. Was so treated. Why didn't, when we, when we came to stand by you, why didn't you come to stand by us? Uh, it's a legitimate question. And is there any other answer you want to add? The only other answer I can add, and this is not a satisfactory answer, except to say that I try as best as I can in carrying on the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., as I understand it, his commitment to nonviolence. And, and to, um, by the way, uh, in support of uh, Israel, support of uh, the Jewish people. I'm, I say that a person like myself, and ironically, a person like you, it poses, poses a greater obligation on us. We, you and I, and other, other, other African Americans and other uh, uh, people, spokespersons in the Jewish community, we, uh, we have an obligation to not be intimidated and not to remain silent. We must raise these issues because only by frankly discussing these issues. Let me segue, I mean, I was in Israel, right? You were at the Herzliya Conference. Herzliya Conference. Was this your first time in Israel? My first time in Israel. But did you enjoy it? I enjoyed it, and I was, it was an extraordinary uh, political, spiritual experience. You gave I an address. I gave, an, uh, I gave a... My, uh, the report I got is you got a standing ovation. You uh, were a big hit at the Herzliya Conference. I, I, I did. But I, I wanted... Okay, so I interrupted you. You were there, and... Well, I, want, I wanted to say that... Uh, one of the things I, uh, one of the things I talked about was on, on leadership. And um, I'm for peace. 
And I'm totally in support of the state of Israel and its right to exist. I also, I'm also a supporter of wanting to find a peaceful resolution. The Jews, the Jewish people, I'm 81 years old. The Jewish people that I remember supported our civil rights movement. I believe, I believe that they would be and are, many of them still living, totally committed as they should be to the state of Israel. I've tried to explain to some of my African-American and non-Jewish friends about the mindset of the current members of the Israeli government. I said, you've got to understand. I said, the current members of the Israeli government and the, uh, the army and the Knesset and so forth, I said, either they themselves or their parents or grandparents, they were part of the Holocaust experience. So when they say never again, they mean it. And the reason they say that is because their historical experience conditions them to understand that they can, at the end of the day, depend on nobody else but themselves. But I believe those people, those Israelis, who hold their country so dear, and who, and who fight for it and want to keep it, uh, uh, they also, they want to do that without losing the very thing that they seek to protect. So, you say, they say, well, Mr. Jones, Professor Jones, how can you deal with a Palestinian wants to kill you? You can't. I'm not, I want to make it very clear. I say to my Palestinian brothers and sisters, and I call them brothers and sisters, is that the only way there's going to be peace in the Middle East, the only way there's going to make a, a settlement with Israel, you've got to 24-7 renounce at all times any and all forms of violence. No Palestinian leader has had the political courage to say, looking back, we made a political mistake. It's looking back. It's about leadership again. It's about it's leadership. It's looking always back. about leadership. Looking back at Medi Look, they mm. might even go so, so far as to say, you know, we've, we've taken some time now to look and study Mahatma Gandhi and, and this, and this African American <laughs> fellow, Martin Luther King Jr. We wish now that we had followed him because the only solution right. is nonviolence. And I say that to them and I say that to my Israeli friends. That's very beautiful, Clarence. I want to roll back a minute. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Where do you feel the African-American community is now on the issue of its relationship to the Jewish community? It seems like it's better, but you know better than I do. Do you feel that, you know, what happened, as you talk about, when the, there was a period of real militancy within the African-American community, and for some reason, again, the Jew was vilified. Part of the issue is the Palestinians. Every now and then right. I hear right. that the black community feels in some way an empathy with the Palestinian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And although I, and I think many people don't understand the problem as you've just described mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. and they make Israel the heavy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm asking you in general, what's your sensitivity now about how the African American community feels about the Jewish community? I feel that the African, in general, it's Clarence Jones' yes. opinion. In general, I think the African American community has a, um, a very positive uh, effect, positive attitude toward the uh, Jewish community. I think that uh, um, I think that the, um, the leadership, some of the cross-sectional leadership of the African American community, uh, under the unusual, particularly historical circumstances of having an African American president, and uh, um, uh, uh, some African Americans, and including myself, we want to. I'm particularly concerned that uh, uh, those American Jews, or even Israel itself, in its effort to justifiably um, uh, get America to honor its defense obligations, that they don't do it in a form, in a way 
that seems to do unnecessarily attack the integrity and credibility of this African-American president. Mm -hmm. Because I listened to Ambassador Oren, I listened to my friends from at the Herzliya conference, and, and at least in terms of what they say, in terms of what they expected this administration to do in support of Israel, that they're doing it, okay? So I think that there's a delicate balance um, uh, or let me put it this way, I'll, I'll turn it around. The best way of developing a broad-based support for Israel in, in America today is that you have significant support in what I call the white evangelical community, but the community that has historically you've had a relationship with, the African-American community. Mm -hmm. This is the community that we better, it's both of our obligations. We need to come home together because at the end of the day, this is a Clarence Jones speaking, at the end of the day, can I tell you my friend, aside from the American Jewish community itself, at the end of the day, potentially, the most reliable community you may want to turn to is the African-American community. You may not think that now, but I'm telling you. And the reason I say that, if we get through a public acknowledgement, as I've tried to do here in this program, okay, what you just said, there was anti-Semitism, people who felt so forth. Now, before this program over, I want to, I want to, I wrote a, I wrote a forward to a book. And the reason I want to bring this book out, because I talk about Simon Wiesenthal, he wrote a book called The Sunflower on the possibilities of limits of forgiveness. Now, I, I was asked to write a foreword to a book called An Unbroken Bond, which is a story by E.D. Ludnick, the untold story of how 658 Cantonese Fitzgerald families faced a tragedy, so forth. This is 9-11. 9-11. And so in this foreword, I want to say, I, I talk, I said, there are some events past and present that challenge our ability to comprehend the magnitude of human pain, suffering, and the destruction associated with them. The Holocaust, slavery in the United States, Hiroshima, genocide atrocities in Rwanda and Serbia, and terrorist killings in, Mum in Mumbai. It is difficult for us to wrap our minds around the enormity of pain and destruction associated with such events. The most, the most challenging issue this book poses is not expressly stated. It is the same haunting question raised by Simon Wiesenthal in his book, The Sunflower, on the possibilities and limits of forgiveness. Writing about his experience as a prisoner in a Nazi concentration camp, Wiesenthal describes a dying Nazi soldier who has asked for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. He asked the reader, what would you do? This is what we now face as we confront the reality of how are we going to have a lasting peace with the Palestinians. Point. I want to ask you about three names. Okay. And I want whatever association you have with them mm -hmm. for me. But we're both Columbia, you and I. Okay. Okay. I grew up. By the way, it's interesting. I don't know if every all of our viewers will understand what I'm about to say. I grew up before the Columbia, but I graduated Columbia before the Columbia bust in 68. In essence, the world changed, Clarence, before 67 and after 67. That is correct. Okay. And for me, I grew up an idealistic liberal Jew. Right. And for me, I always saw in the black attempt to win complete civil rights in this country and to be treated at you know the the glory the glorified the glor the, the I'm, I'm searching for the right word this extraordinary expression in the i have, I have a dream speech mm -hmm. that you're judged not by the color of, right. not by your color but by right. your character Car right. content of your character, character right okay that was what dro drove me right as a you and a lot of other Amer white yes. americans right as a Jew, right. 
the Passover message, right. which is at the essence of the Jewish people's birth, right. is that no one on earth may be enslaved by another human being. Absolutely. And that the intrinsic responsibility of every lovely, good human being is wherever you see anyone enslaved in any way, n whether it's sexually, monetarily, That's spiritually, right. emotionally. Doesn't matter what color they are. You cannot enslave another. Everyone right. has, you know, again, the American dream was to realize the biblical right. idea that we all are endowed with inalienable rights by a creator. Right. And whether one believes in that literally or not, it right. is the greatest expression right. of human values. Right. So I grow up in that world. Right. And I will just tell you a little brief story, my story, sure, you know. Please do. I fall in love with a voice on radio before I know who the voice is. The voice, I was a young child, and the voice belonged to a, a broadcaster who did a children's program every weekend for children. His name was Jackie Robinson. Oh. I did not know uh -huh. anything but this voice. Uh -huh. I find out he plays for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Mm. I become a huge Dodger fan. I am a huge Jackie Robinson fan. But right. in those days, right. we're listening basically on radio. Right. My grandfather takes me to my first baseball game at the Polo Grounds, right. where the Giants are playing the Dodgers. It'll right. be the first time I ever see Jackie Robinson. It always almost makes me want to cry. I'm sitting in the upper deck behind home plate, and I say to my grandfather, where is Jackie Robinson? And he points down to the field and he says, there he is. I'm a child. I'm six years old, seven years old. I have no idea who he's pointing to. Finally, I understand he's pointing to this ball player with number 42 on his back. And Clarence, he's black. I had no idea. It never occurred to me. He was just a ball player. It was a transformative moment in my life. And from then on, it didn't matter what color a person was. What ultimately the King's speech talks about, the content of character, mm -hmm. resonated in me as a Jew. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, the black struggle and the Jewish struggle are identical. We're both minorities. We're both trying to seek a world in which That's, that was who Dr. we King's, are is irrelevant. That was Dr. King's And premise. I still want to be me, but I want to be a Jew. Absolutely, right. You have a right to be an African-American. We have the right to be who we are. Yeah. At who we, we right. will be treated equally as we are. Yeah. That was Dr. King's premise on the okay. basis of his friendship with Abraham Joshua Heschel. Okay. Right. Now, I'm older. Okay. And these are the names I want you to relate to. Okay. Cheney, Goodman, Schwerner. The three civil rights activists, two of whom are Jews and one is a black man, who ultimately are victims of the civil rights movement. And for me, the three of them become emblematic of something where Jew and African American stand shoulder to shoulder in a quest of eternal monumental proportions. And I'm asking you whether those names have any of the same meaning for you that they do for me, because you are not me, and you do not come from my background. But I want to know what they mean to you. Those names define the template of the civil rights movement in the United States. For your listeners, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner. James Cheney was a local African-American boy from Mississippi. Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner were two white boys, Jewish lads, who had come down in 1964 to aid in the registration of voters in Mississippi. They were arrested by the uh, police in Mississippi and according to some pre-arranged plan with the police department and the local clan, they were set free only to be accosted on the road outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi, where they were killed. And they were killed because they were working together. In fact, they referred to the Jewish boy when they were killing him. Uh, in the uh, uh, you know the 
pejorative word of uh, being a kike and a nigger lover and all of that. I uh, knew uh, the parents. I knew Carolyn Goodman. I knew the parents, uh, the Swerners. And uh, when I said what I said at the beginning of the program, I had them in mind. I, I had them in mind. In fact, on November 8th, when we were watching the, uh, I was watching the election returns. In the last presidential last election? Last presidential election, 2008. Barack Obama, Barack John Obama, McCain. John McCain. I was assembled at a home of about 40 people, 30, 40 people, African Americans, Asians, men, women, so forth. When the networks declared that um, Senator Barack Obama was, had, had accumulated sufficient electoral votes that he could now be called president-elect. People in the room started to cry and to tear up. And someone came over to me and they saw me with tears in my eyes. And they said, did you ever, Professor Jones, did you ever think you would live long enough to see an African-American become president of the United States? I said, no. I said, but my tears are not for the election of Barack Obama. My tears are for all those people whom I personally knew, who worked sometimes day and night to make his election possible, worked and in some cases gave their lives to make his election possible. My tears were for people like Cheney, Goodman, Ms. Schwerner. Yes. My tears were for Reverend uh, James Reeve, an Episco white Episcopalian, Episcopalian, white Episcopalian minister. My tears were for four little girls who were dynamited in the 16th Street Baptist Church. My tears were for Stanley Levison. My tears were for Abraham Joshua Heschel. My tears are for all of those people, all of those people whom I personally knew, who made the election of Barack Hussein possible. Were there also tears for Martin Luther King Jr.? Oh, and I mentioned, yes, I'm sorry. Obviously, <laughs> I said, <laughs> I mentioned Martin Luther King Jr., yeah. Actually, actually, um, uh, um, uh, you, your viewers can go onto YouTube and uh, uh, what I said was part of an acceptance speech I gave when I was uh, fortunate enough to be uh, awarded the uh, Legacy of the Dream Award by Georgetown University. And if you go on y and Google YouTube for January 16th, you'll see my acceptance speech. And I tell that story. Yes, my tears, obviously, That's from Martin Luther King Jr. Okay. You write this book, Behind the Dream, the making of the speech that transformed the nation. Yes. And I want, I, you, know, you know, you've seen this happen many times throughout your history. There is often a conflation of fact and fantasy. Things become, uh, things that are apocryphal become t stated as fact. So I want some facts from you. Okay. Did you have any hand at all in creating this speech? Um. I contributed. Um, you suggested. Remember? I yes. contributed the um, text of uh, the suggested opening paragraphs that Dr. King might consider using. But let me put the background. What I simply wrote down was a summary of what he and I and Stanley Levison, Baird Rustin, and other people had talked about. I had just simply summarized. Uh, those ideas and put them in a form in which he might consider using them in his opening remarks. I'm, 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 um, I, I'm standing behind him, uh, maybe 50 feet behind him, okay? At what point? D during the port that he's giving the speech. You mean at the Lincoln Memorial? At the Lincoln Memorial, Memorial. Okay. okay. So I'm, I'm, you know, he's... Okay, he's and what, what I wanted to know was, in the end, how much of it was 
literally written in front of him, and for all I know, every word was in front of him, was any of it extemporaneous? Most of the most celebrated, that's the point I want to make. Yes. Is that the, 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 the part of the speech that is most celebrated, everybody talks about, was totally extemporaneous. And totally that just came out of him. Yeah. It, it, what, what happened is that after he, he, he was reading the uh, prepared text, including the material I suggested, and then, as he often did, included his own material that he had added. And at some point, Mahalia Jackson, his famous gospel singer, who was on the podium with him, shouted to him, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. And, I'm, and I saw him look at the text, acknowledge her, slide the text over to the left side of the podium, grab the podium and look out on all those people assembled. And I said to some person, whoever that was, standing next to me, and I said, those people don't know it. But that, they're about ready to go to church <laughs> because I could see him uh, change into his preacher mode. By the way, this, this, this book uh, was jointly written with the Stuart Conley, so I want to be sure that he gets appropriate dimension. The book Behind the Dream is a book by Clarence Jones and Stuart Conley, and I welcomed uh, uh, Stuart's assistance and work with me in, in writing this great book. So you see this transformation oh, right I happen, see. right? Right. right, right and right. all of a sudden, some of the most eloquent words ever expressed by an you know, with the Gettysburg Address, with the Declaration of Independence, there is I this I Have a Dream my, speech. In, my, in, my, uh, in the book, I describe it as like a transcendental experience. I'd seen him speak many times before. I had heard him speak many times before. Never, ever ever before had I seen Martin Luther King Jr. on that day, at that place, at that time, speak like that. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be, be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. And every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain. And the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day 
And this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tears of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring. From the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, let freedom ring. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring. From the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania, let freedom ring. From the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado, let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. It was as if some great force had come and possessed him, had taken over, so that he was speaking in an out-of-body experience. Because I'd never seen this before. I'd never heard this before. And it was totally extemporaneous and totally... Was it thrilling for you? It was thrilling. It was electrifying. It was electrifying you have, it was like never had I ever seen him speak like that before and never did I ever hear him speak like that afterwards. and he by the way was a great speaker when he the got greatest, up on a the pulpit, greatest the greatest yeah, one of the greatest I, the I had the privilege of being in his presence once hearing him greatest, speak right. it was enthralling right. and speak about one more speech which is also played very often mm -hmm. So often, Clarence, there seemed to be biblical references when he spoke. And for him, there was this sort of the message of the Jewish exodus and the journey the Jews took as they left Egypt on the way to the promised land became a theme he, one would often hear him Over recite. and over, right. And then he does what in essence becomes his last great speech where he talks about how he's been to the mountaintop. Okay. First of all, by any chance, were you there? No, I was on my way. Okay. I was on my way. But you, I'm sure you've heard it many oh, times. Many times. Right. Okay. Um, I'm asking you now in terms of giving our audience a perspective on an American hero. <clears throat> what did that speech mean when you did hear it and you understood it? And quite honestly, as somebody who loved him dearly, were you worried for his life? At all times. But let me just say this. It's important for your viewers to recall that uh, he is popularly remembered as a civil rights leader. But in fact, the way in which he most liked to be uh, identified and most liked to be uh, called was reverend. He was a minister of the gospel. He was, the doctor stood for his having received a PhD in theology from the Boston School of Divinity. He is a fourth generation Baptist preacher. He is a religious man. He is a, a um, uh, uh, steeped in the um, uh, in the, in the knowledge and in, in the traditions and knowledge of the uh, of the Bible, the King James version of the Bible, the Old Testament, and interestingly enough, the Talmud. He was first and foremost a minister of the gospel. Okay, that's important to understand. Civil rights leader was a secondary 
appendage, a secondary a category, not the category that defined him as the person. Okay. When I heard and read the text of the speech that he gave at the Mason Temple on uh, uh, August, uh, I'm sorry, on April 3rd, uh, 1968, that evening. The first thing I thought it was reflected what I knew. He was tired. He was um, depressed. He had, uh, uh, he frequently, uh, and more so in 1968 than at other, not, not that it hadn't occurred in the past, in earlier times, but frequently had this kind of, uh, not kind of, had this concept of, of his own limited mortality. That it was, uh, it was just part of the process, you know. It's not a question of, he never thought he would live a long time. At least my observation was from talking with him. Um, and so that um, whatever else was going on in his life at that time, and in the movement, those um, words reflected his sense of um, almost resignation. Yeah. So he is saying, he is saying, as you know those words, he's saying, I've, I've been to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land and I may not be there I may not be there, get there with you when you get to the promised land, but I have seen the promised land, which was, again, his abiding prophetic faith in the confidence of America, that, it, that we as a people, we as a nation, we would realize that we would be the best that we could be. That's what that speech was about. Where were you when he was shot? I was uh, getting dressed, rushing to go to the airport in Manhattan. The phone rings. The, the phone rings. It's Harry Belafonte on the phone. And he says, Clarence, what are you doing? I says, Harry, I'm, I'm rushing to get to the airport. He says, turn on the television. He says, what are you talking about? He says, Martin's been shot. First I knew about it. I turned on the television. And I couldn't believe it. And then I, uh, I get on the phone and I try to reach somebody down in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and then uh, uh, Harry Belafonte calls me, calls me back again. He says, you have the television on? And I think, he may be, I think he may be dead. I then talk to someone down in uh, Memphis, Tennessee on the phone. And when I, and when, the f when, I, when I reach that person, the first thing they say, Clarence, Martin is dead devastating. Clarence, first of all, I know it must have been, I mean, you lost a friend. Yes, I did. We lost an icon. You lost a friend. So I'm sure that part of whatever you experienced after his assassination was just grief over the loss of a friend, correct? It was grief and it was anger. Anger. Who are you angry at? Initially, my anger was at this, uh, my reaction, uh, literally my reaction was, they finally got him. So when you say, yes. they. Yes. And by the way, the they for you mm. had an emotive reality. Yeah. Who was the they? The they was collectively all of those people, particularly those people who hated him and who hated what he was seeking to do. They hated him so much that they would be prepared to kill him. Um, and so I, when I say they... Okay. Was it, am I, am I, is it fair for me to say that the they in some way is, and if I had to give a face to it, mm -hmm. I don't mean it literally, I mean mm -hmm. it symbolically. Mm -hmm. It was the, what was then the George Wallace mentality. 
Yes. Yes. Wasn't it? Yes, that, I, yes. That's the way I thought. Yes. Yeah. I'm not. I mean, I thought. Yes. I thought. Yes. I thought of the hard. Yes. R I thought of the right wing hard racist yes. mentality that would want to right. kill him. And by the way, you understand. I felt. He was mine. They took him away from me. It didn't matter that he was black. We were in this together. Right, right. They took my Martin Luther King Jr. Well, you do you understand that an American Jew could feel that? I do. I really do. And, is, and, I'm, 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 and, and that's a reflection, by the way, Mark. The fact that you say that, I've been in other places, and I've heard, I've heard other Jews say that. I've heard other white Americans say that, but I must say, the people who say it with the greatest sense of loss and passion are American Jews. That, from my generation that I remember, they, they really feel it was lost. You're an extraordinary soul, and it has been just one of the most wonderful things to meet you and to feel I know you a little bit. Thank you very much. Uh, and I give Sherry Rogers a lot of credit for bringing us together. Thank you so much. It, what, a, what an absolute delight and joy and inspiration you are. And you are making a major contribution in so many ways. And you know, the, the, the book Behind the Dream is one thing I hope people pick up. But you've written a lot, and many people should learn from you. I write a regular column on the Huffington Post, and yes. you go, so forth. So I wrote another book called um, what would Martin say, published yes. by Harper Collins to an earlier? I would say that um, I've never forgotten the love uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, lots of Jewish people. As I, you know, I'm a, I'm a young African American student at Columbia. You know, there's nothing. Okay, who are my principal friends? They're not. There are nine other. Af there are eight other African Americans. I think in my class or something. But I became friendly. Most of the people who were friendly with I were, were Jews. Okay, and they became lifelong friends of mine. I say to you, thank you, my brother. Kol tu v'hatzlacha, which means all goodness and success to you. You are an extraordinary human thank being. Thank you, thank you. It's been an honor. I hope we get to talk again and thank see each so other often. Thank, thank you, thank Clarence. you so much. All the best. And thank you viewers, very much. To your viewers, um, I'm I'm honored that you had me on. Thank you. And I want the, those viewers who uh, felt uh, betrayed and hurt over legitimately perceived uh, anti-Semitism that occurred in the past. They weren't crazy, okay? It did occur, and that they should rise above that and join with us now, okay? And uh, I, uh, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be um, the person I am but for the love of my, my parents, and but for the love of so many African-American people who stood by me, and so many Jewish people, friends, loved ones who, who stood by me. It's uh, an honor to stand near you. I just hope there will be other times when we'll be in each other's presence. I learn from you. and. And you have filled me with tremendous sense of, of compassion and even love. And I thank you, Clarence, from the bottom of my heart. Oh, God, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was my meeting with Clarence Jones. We hope you enjoyed meeting him as well. And as Clarence says, if any of you would like to be in touch with him, please email me. And he has said I can graciously forward your emails on to him, and he will answer you. So please be in touch with me this week. Email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage 
and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. Mechaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media.